We wandering children, one and all, marvel at our dark equine form. See how invitingly bridled we be, and don't worry, our saddle is expandable for you and all your tasty friends. Cause it's time to nay tell to me. <laughs> Have you ever ridden a horse, Nick? I haven't. I would really like to before yeah, I die. Overrated. I know you're you're not fond of horses, but I'm fascinated by them. I'm allergic. <laughs> I'm fascinated, and I'm allergic. Welcome back. I am Omen Sade, and I am allergic. No, I'm Nick McGill. Together we are feckless moms, and this is Talk Tall to Me, a therianthropic transformation on the rocky banks of Loch Progrock in which Naughty Nick and, oh, we'll just go for a quick stroll, Omen, will climb into the saddle of every single slippery song that shape-shifting prog rock band Jethro Tull has ever produced. We will let Martin Barr run free out of the paddock. We will feed John Evans a handful of tasty oats. And we will, with some difficulty, bridle Barrymore Barlow. And, if it comes to it, We will cut off our own fingers if they became stuck in Ian Anderson's seaweed-tangled locks. Very good. Very good. As usual... I have my knife ready. You excel, as usual. I have sharpened a flute. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Ian can use that as a weapon, for sure. That's true. Proficient in, in flute. Hello. Welcome back. Hi, Nick. Big episode today. Big one. We got we got some stuff to get through. Not only two songs, two bonus tracks off of yeah. Stormwatch, but we've got two other things as well. Uh, if you could, uh, if Mary, Marley, if you guys could come in, that, that would be greatly appreciated. And Marley. Hmm, thank you so much, Mary. Thanks, Marley. Where, thank you. Mary, why are you, uh, why are you all wet? You're dripping everywhere. I went down to the aquarium and rode the seahorses. I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's, how did you get, how did you manage to get on? The, aren't they rather small? Are you calling me fat? No, I am not. Wow. I definitely am not. You say that again to me face and see if you live. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Very sensitive. I am, I am impressed, but very sensitive. <laughs> All right. Gonna have to, gonna have to dry the carpets now. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. What have you got there, Nick? Something we haven't had in a while, but thanks to the big old toll burst that we had, we have our last review of 2021. Sir, sensors have detected another star in the sky. Dear Lord, that's five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. This comes from JT Fan 78 via Apple Podcasts. Wow. I'm the first hundred tall fans out there. <laughs> For all of you listeners, it is Apple Podcasts. Despite what Omen says every week, it is not Apple Music. No, no, no. The title of the review is Big Tall Fan. They say, I'm in my mid 50s and saw my first tall concert back in 78. Oh, what wow. a good year to see them. That would have been wow. Heavy Horses, yeah? I think. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it would have been. I haven't missed a tour since. Wow. I found this podcast very entertaining. I fell in love with the insight and humor. After my third episode, I had to give it a five star. Now I follow this regularly. I can't wait for the review and new album release. Yes. 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 Thank you so much, Tall Fan. Uh, And I mean, you know, we really... This this podcast is in large part because we wish we could be you. We wish we could oh have seen God. all those yeah. tours. Um, and so we are living vicariously through your listenership, through the, the reverse transmissive property of memories. Yep. That's a thing. Mm-hmm. It is. That's it for me. Omen, what did Mary give you? Besides a pile of seaweed on my floor, she also gave me this damp letter. From a new writer in her. New writer in her, how thrilling! David writes Hi, Omen and Nick. I can't believe that I just discovered your wonderful podcast. 
I have been a Jethro Tull fan for many years, and really have nobody with whom I can share my passion. Your words are a soothing balm that make me feel that I am finally home. <laughs> Check out our merch page for Talk Tell to Me Soothing Balm. <laughs> <laughs> for, for all of your chapped parts. He goes on, the first full episode that I've heard is The Last Man at the Party, which seems like an odd place to start a journey, although I'm probably the last Tall fan to arrive at this party. We certainly hope not. Your commentary was delightful, and I learned things about a song to which I have closely listened at least dozens of times. It is interesting to hear your understanding of the lyrics that are fairly straightforward for the most part. I always took the line, Will the last man at the party wish me a happy new year? To mean that in all the revelry, debauchery, and self-absorption of the guests, that no one had even wished him a happy new year. I may even detect a little cynicism in Ian's tone on this line. Maybe it is being said that the focus of the gathering should be more on the camaraderie and less on the revelry. Sister Bridget, Cousin Jimmy, and Stinky Joe seem like they are wasting no time in arriving at the state of inebriation, and maybe they are not even taking a moment to raise a glass. All of us are absorbed in our own worlds and desires, and we need to take a moment to appreciate each other and our connections. Oh, well, I will stop rambling now. Please know that I very much appreciate you sharing your insights into this magical world. I'm looking forward to hours of listening to your charming voices. I will lie down tonight after a long day of work with my eyes closed and your thoughts in my ears. Good. Kindest regards. The responsibility. With our thoughts in your ears and, and your feet in, <laughs> in, in my shoes. In our socks. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is such an honor to have your ears to listen to this uh, podcast. We are, are just so thrilled to week after week get to talk to Tull about this incredible work. Absolutely. I, I think I think he, he brings up a great point about last man at the party. Just in just the, I agree. Just, I think it I think it encompasses the general idea that sometimes you and I think way too big uh, on some of these songs. You know, maybe it's it's to be taken at face value. Yeah, sometimes I think you're right. But on the other hand, we have 45 minutes to fill. That's true. A fun note about com camaraderie. Camaraderie. Or camaraderie, as I would say. Camaraderie. I was listening to a podcast in which a couple of American uh, ex-military guys were talking about leadership in, in the SEAL teams that they were a part of. And one of them said like, oh, well, you know, in the SEALs versus in the the Army Green Berets, there's a lot more camaraderie. Huh. And I was like, oh, four syllables? What? And that was from an that was that was spoken by an American yeah. from the South. Oh, from the South. Interesting. Well, the South has a lot more in common with across the pond than really with what how we speak. So linguistically sometimes. at least. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Well, thank you all for your kind words, your kind stars, and Nick. Without much further ado, what are we listening to first today? We have a jam-packed episode. Let's jump right into the instrumental off of the bonus tracks. We're going to listen to King Henry's Madrigal. I love jam, but I can't have it because it makes me fat. Did I, oh, did I say jam-packed? Is that what that was? You did. Okay. <laughs> I will play it, though. And there you have it, Nick. There it is. Believe it or not, that song is three minutes long. Oh my gosh. Feels feels half that. It's a radio hit length. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, it swept the radio stations of uh, 16th century England. They <laughs> were just, they loved it. They loved it. They did. They did. Mm, before we dive into the historical implications of the song, shall we talk musically? Yeah, let's get into music first. I think that's a good idea. So... I'm not sure. I mean, we know this. We know the original version of this song, King Henry's Madrigal, also called Pastime with Good Company. That's what he wrote, or also known as the King's Ballad, because we worked at a Renaissance festival for 11 years. We sure did. The secret's out. The secret, don't tell anyone. <laughs> but, but originally, this was written by Henry VIII, 
for uh, it is thought to be to have been written for Catherine of Aragon. Oh, that makes sense. That this has a very Catherine Catherine of Aragon vibe. It was super popular because he was the king and he wrote a song. <laughs> because it was le- people were legally obliged to like it. They had to. They had to. But it was the lyrically it was a it was about rich guys enjoying things basically. For my past dance hunt sing and dance my heart is set all goodly sport for my comfort who shall me let. Yeah, it's it's all about it's all about I like to go hunting and I like to fence. And I like to fish. Yeah. And I like ladies. Yeah. And I like dancing. And I like drinking. It was it was pretty much it was Hank Ocho's anthem, basically. It was it's what would play when he entered the ring. The, yeah, yeah, pretty much. It probably literally did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's actually very valid, yeah. Do we want to hear a quick little jaunt of what it more likely sounded like? Yes. Everyone take a quick shot of cholera and let's have a listen. Here we go. So there, there we have some of, some of the more traditional instrumentation, no? Yeah, drums, sack butt, probably hurdy gurdy, possibly oh like God. all those all those weird little Renaissance instruments that that sound sound like they're barely making music, <laughs> and they're also in pain at the same time. <laughs> I you say what you will. I love the sound of a sack butt. I do too. I one hundred percent do too. But it, it, there's. There's a certain lack of musicality there in, in terms of readiness. what we're accustomed yes, to. Yes, there's yeah. a, an earthiness to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is another instance of Ian taking a classical song and jazzing the hell out of it or rocking the hell out of it. Yeah, you know, non-chronologically, but kind of what we saw on the Christmas album with uh, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Sure. I was thinking of Beret, actually. Oh, Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I just want to put in a credit there. The, the clip that we heard was by the English prog folk rock band Griffin. Oh. And it appeared on their, their 1973 self-titled album. Oh, wow. Yeah. That actually predates this. Well, yeah, as did the, well, as did the as original. As did the 16th century. <laughs> yes. Blackmore's Night has also done this. I love the, the idea that he wrote it for Catherine of Aragon. Because the first line is, Pastime with good company, I love and shall until... I die, by which I mean until I marry six other people. Until you die, until actually. You die. <laughs> actually, long before you die, yeah. I stop loving you. Pastime with good company until I create a new religion. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what it is. Pretty much, yeah. King Henry. What a what a guy. He's resourceful. He was resourceful. It's fine. He knew what he wanted, and he had the resources to try to get it. And and he did many times. Yep. Did he ever really get what he wanted? I mean, probably not. He got gout. Did he like the? Did, did he, he want, want the gout? gout? No, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Musically, musically, this is a multi multi tiered cake. It sure is. I mean, Ian does some great things to kind of lead us through it. He sets out at the very top with giving us a pretty straightforward version of the tune. You know, a very recognizable. <laughs> So that our ear can get used to it and hear, okay, this is this is where we're starting from. Because otherwise, it wouldn't. It'd be no fun to go on the the journey, right? If you, particularly if you don't know the song, orig- the original piece, you know, if right. you don't know the tune, you need some sort of placement in reality before the derivation happens. Exactly, and if you do know this tune, then it's nice to be like, ah, this is the Henry yeah. VIII song, yeah, right, right, and then. We take the chocks off the wheels and we spin the propeller. And we take off. And we take off. We have Ian's breakdown. In which he's going, he's using the chords of the song, but he's, he's really 
taking those chords and exploding them into the scales and finding his own pathway through those chord changes. There's some really lovely parts that I enjoy. Um, for instance, there's a, there are a number of points where the organ is doing these 16th note arpeggios. Yep, I, I have that note. And then the flute is kind of weaving in and out of that in a way that almost creates these these um what's that thing called when you have set, sets of waves and then the waves stack on top of each other and sometimes oh. you know at the peak when both of the peaks aligns it's like yeah i i don't know the term for that i'm sure our our music people will have a response for that though but it has this sense of like kind of a a heart fluttering really exciting feeling which is you know uh, fantastic that they can bring that sense of breathlessness to a to a piece of music that is almost 500 years old right yeah played by a, a pretty pretty bitch and rock band yeah indeed so those arpeggios are, are at about a minute and a half yep the up and down right after that there's there's another it's it's like part of the weird breakdown that the bass bass does a pretty much the same thing it goes in and out it goes all over the place in the background yeah and the bass is great in this it, this is not john glascock i believe it's probably ian sure but the idea of of not just doing like boom 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 but like really he 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 fiddles up and down on that on that thing yeah we've got so many instruments going on in this. I mean, we've got we've got the bass, we've got the drums and guitar, multiple flutes, I think. I oh, think there's a low flute underneath. I wonder if that could be an organ tone. Yeah, that's always my hesitance to to mention a second flute because sometimes I can't Whatever quite you tell. Do, don't mention the second flute. <laughs> the second flute was on the 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 grassy no the mossy knoll the grassy knoll. Second gunman on the. Grassy oh knoll. yes, I yeah. was thinking of faulty towers and the Germans are here. Don't mention the war. Oh okay, also good. Another fun thing that happens is that toward the the back half of the song we have Barrymore charging in with the drums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a way that kind of breaks through. And you might think that that's kind of a very modern take on it, but actually I think it's very faithful to the to the ancient music style and to the the style that the style of music that was played in the 16 century because you had the tambour. Okay, yeah. Which is just a fancy word for a drum. Big old drum, yep. And it was it featured heavily in those. I mean, it was the it was the bass and rhythmic sound, and it provided the beat for all the galliards and um, madrigals and dances that that people did for their entertainment. And those dances were quite vigorous. And it was, it was a single drum. It wasn't like a drum kit, so it would really just be boom, boom. It would keep your beat every now and then. They'd do a a, a speed up or something like a boom, boom, boom. But for the most part. It's it's like like at the end of that song where it's dish, dish, mm, you hear yeah. those splashes. But in this, but in some of the parts where he he makes it a little bit more, more complex, and you hear that. Duk -a -duk -dum, duk -a -dum. Yes, yeah. That's I think that was also something that would be used to kind of drive forward that the frenzy of the the dance. Yeah, the frenzy of the gout. The, the gout frenzy. <laughs> all all gout must go. So the the final piece that I want to talk about is well, no, I guess I've got two more. The organ in here yes. is wonderful. And then we also have like a xylophone effect in there as well. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it is the xylophone or if it's on the organ or what, but xylophone comes in pretty early actually. Delightful. I totally missed that part. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's only for like the first third of it, and then and then the the organ really it just kind of, goes goes crazy. It has that chimes feel. Yeah. Mm, delightful. Wow. Yeah, I find I find when when we do hear 
xylophone or marimba or any of those like little per- percussive malleted instruments in a toll song it's really only for just a little snippet and then it goes away they it's i don't i i would i'm hard pressed to think of a toll song where that subsists all the way through a little xylophone goes a long way it really does it really does i think it would get old and i'm genuine here i'm not being a smart ass i do think it 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 would get old if you heard it the whole way. You know, you would lose lose some of the effect. I think so. I, I think it's a it's wonderful as an effect, or you know, in an orchestra. The marimba. Now, I would listen to the, to the marimba as a lead instrument. You know, from an hour. That's a lot a lot nicer on the ear because it's made of wood. The keys are made yeah. of wood rather than and the xylophone is all made of metal. Yeah. Nick, anything else to say about King Henry's Madrigal? This cover. It's because it's a, it's a cover. This is a cover song, technically, right? Yeah, I guess you could, <laughs> you could call it that. I guess you could call it that. No one, no one ever has, but we we just did. Yeah. This cover reminds me of a band that I used to listen to in high school, named Ozma. Oh. They covered the the Russian folk song Koro by Niki, which was the Tetris theme song on the Nintendo oh, Game Boy. interesting. Sure. So here's a clip of the Tetris. Here's the, the Game Boy clip here, the 8-bit wonderland that it is. Give it to me. Yes, dancing bears all round, <laughs> wearing fezes. Yeah, okay. So that's that, and then here is the. I could listen to that song on repeat. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's something really satisfying about things adapted into other forms. I mean, they, I mean, we we do it all the time. There's practically nothing else. We love hearing a traditional song played by a rock band. We love hearing a rock song played by an orchestra. We love oh, seeing sure, yeah. a comic book done in a cinematic way. We love seeing a. A musical made into a movie or a movie made into a musical. There's something lovely about about saying, it's that thing that I know, but different. Yeah. Yeah, You it, it allows you to approach a new form of something with a level of understanding. You're not approaching something completely out of the blue. But also, there's also that novelty. Yeah. As Alec Guinness said in the first Star Wars movie, that's no sack butt. You remember yep. that that scene? I do. I do remember that. It was in the cantina, right? It was in the yeah. Uh, can- yeah okay. Great. <laughs> Let's get our feet wet in oh. the lock of this next song. Omen, what's the next song? The next song is Kelpie. <laughs> There we have Kelpie. There it is, Omen. Unbridled. And there we have... Un- <laughs> yes, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> um, Nick, sort of traditional question for you at this point. Where does this song rank for you in the in the dozen or so from the Stormwatch era? You likey or you leavey behindy? Me no like you that. This you- <laughs> the, this song is the favorite song that I didn't know was my favorite. Oh, the dark horse, if you will. The dark horse. Boy, I like this song. It's very yeah, it's really good. Great. I did not realize how much I like this song. But by gummy, it's good. By gummy. By gummy. What about you, Omen? First thoughts? I freaking love this song. Yeah, it's really good. I'm glad to have had an opportunity to sit down with it. Yeah. And I've always been confused about this song because I conflated in my mind, as you know, as we found out before we started recording, the word Kelpie with the word Selkie, which is a different kind of... Shape-shifting. Celtic northern, North Sea creature of mythology. Yeah, it's understandable. 
And I was always very confused because it didn't really fit the description of a Selkie. Now I realize that's because that's not what it's about. <laughs> yeah. So, it's enlightening, really. So, so Nick, what is a Kelpie? A uh, Kelpie is Scottish mythological creature that is a shape-shifting inhabitant of locks. Yes. Not not the delicious smoked salmon, but the the lakes in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> the lochs. Uh, oh, the loch. There's a horse in my lochs. They are aquatic <laughs> horses, but they can turn human and they can lure people in their human form or they can lure people in their horse form. Yeah, they're really the Swiss army knife of Celtic folklore. Yeah, they can they can get a lot of things done. They're also meat eaters. Oh, okay. They would often lure people onto their back by standing around looking like a nice pretty pony that wanted, you know, a ride and would be, you know, have a lovely saddle and look alluringly decked out for riding. And as soon as you would get onto its back, it would plunge down into the lake, drown you, eat you, and then spit out your entrails. Oh, it doesn't like the entrails? It's, no. Okay. It gets stuck. So traditionally, Kelpies are male in their human form, which fits perfectly with the song. That's true. But I'm seeing so much art of female Selkies. It's it's curious. A female Kelpies. I mean, um, female Kelpies, yeah. Well, I think that that was a product of the romantic period in art where mostly male painters were like, I have to paint nude women. Uh, the theme is uh, Kelpie, yeah. sure. I just, I really want to paint a wet naked lady. How can I do that? Right. Yeah. Go sit by that lake. Why? Uh, uh, folklore, folklore, folklore. Scottish, yeah. Scottish folklore. Yeah. Yeah. Take it off. And, and maybe I'm, maybe there are more stories than I am aware of regarding the Kelpie that, that kind of pertain to the, the female form, but it does, it does seem like they're mostly thought of as being masculine in their human form. Yeah. Often they would in their human form be betrayed by their, by the presence of their hooves, which they couldn't transform. Ah, interesting. Which, when the Christian missionaries came to the northern bits of Scotland, they formed an association with the devil. Sure. Okay. Right. Because they already had the idea of the devil as having, having cloven feet. Yep. Other potential cultural similarities. We have the Germanic Nixie, Scandinavian Bachhurst, <laughs> and, the, and the, the Australian Bunyip. Yeah, sure. All aggressive, dangerous water spirits. Yep, and having horse-like properties. Yeah. So there's some interesting things. Apparently, it was very common to for each lake in Scotland to have its own Kelpie. And there are a couple of different theories as to the origin of the myth. One is that it was a very simply a very useful and practical tool for keeping your children in line, saying, don't go and play by the lake because right, yeah. there's uh, an evil beastie in there. Also, it could be a way of explaining mysterious drownings, mm -hmm. but it could also be a way of explaining water spouts that would sometimes occur on these very flat, oh, windy places. Okay, you know, flat, flat on the lake, but windy because the mountains were all around them in Scotland, being whipping the wind into all these different shapes and creating a water spout in the middle of the lake, which could look like some kind of a mysterious figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True to mythology, it, it's usually usually to explain something that. At the time, science did not exist to to explain. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Some fun little connections for us. Guess who wrote a little bit about the Kelpie, or at least references the Kelpie. Do you want silly answers or the actual answer? I would like silly answers. Uh, Mark Twain. Um, uh, Nabokov. Uh, uh, <laughs> Grigory Sandovich. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Very good. Now the silly answers. <laughs> oh. Oh. No, what's the real answer? Who do you think? Uh, Burns. Robert Burns, your friend and mine, and most importantly, Ian's, Ian's friend, Robert Burns. Ian's bosom buddy. Wrote in his 1786, address to the devil. <laughs> devil. <laughs> hell. Dear devil. Three, three two, hell. one, hell. He wrote... When those dissolve in snowy hoard and float the jingling icy board, then water kelpies haunt the ford by your direction. Our knighted travelers are allured to their destruction. 
Yes. Yeah. He did. He did write that. He did write that. Sure did. Another fun little thing is, you know, there were ways of of capturing the Kelpie. Oh yeah. And if you could capture the Kelpie, that would be very useful because of you know various things. But in, in one one thing you could do with it is uh, breed it with regular horses, in which case the offspring would be impossible to drown and have shorter ears. And if you could capture it, usually with some kind of like a Christian symbol, you could make it work for you, and they were incredibly strong. Yep. So there's this there's this myth that um, the Laird of Morphy caught a Kelpie and employed the Kelpie or enslaved the Kelpie to carry these huge stones up to the hilltop to, to build his, his castle. And when he finally released the Kelpie, the Kelpie was rather unpleased. A, l- a little miffed, yeah. A little miffed and cursed the, the, the local king. What did he say, Omen? He said, Sir Beck and Sir Baines, drive in the Laird of Murphy's stains. The Laird of Murphy will never thrive as long as the Kelpie is alive. <laughs> You're getting comically good at that. Lost it toward the end. <laughs> and in, in observance of the Kelpie's curse, the Lord of Murphy's uh, didn't he didn't uh, pass on a lot of progenitors and his kingdom failed. So yeah. what's that tell you, Nick? That Kelpies don't don't piss off a Kelpie. Don't piss off a Kelpie. What should you do? Avoid the Kelpie? Come ride with the Kelpies. Oh sure. Uh one last thing before we dive into the song. Please. Located between Falkirk and Grangemouth, standing next to the Forth and Clyde Canal, are two 98-foot-high horsehead sculptures called the Kelpies. Oh, that's right. And they've been there since the very beginning of time. The very beginning of time, if that beginning of time was 2014. Well, for some people it was. Oh, that's true. That's true. Sculpted by Andy Scott, they are gorgeous they're absolutely beautiful they i highly recommend you just do a quick google search to take a look at them they're they're really wonderful do you think he got the job because of his last name do you think the committee was like well we need a really scottish person for this job who's more scottish than andy (laughs) (laughs) that's possible Yeah. yeah so the song itself remember back when we talked I think it was Elegy. Okay. When we talked about that that ballet that Ian and Martin and Dee wrote. Oh, yes. By the Waterside, wasn't it called? Water's Edge. The Water's, Water's Edge. Water's Edge, yes. Yep. That had the origins of Dark Ages Elegy and Kelpie because the story uh, itself was about the Kelpie. Right. So this... The idea of this coming from this time period would have been like just... Just pre Stormwatch, but the the creation of the song itself came from that. Well, and it fits into the you know to the time period where Ian was spending a lot of time in the Highlands and yep. on the islands where all these myths were, where these myths inhabited the landscape. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's he's still eyeballs deep in the culture and the lore and the myth. Not necessarily the the English, but he he definitely went more full on Scottish for for Stormwatch. But Indeed. it's like it's it's distilled. It's so much more potent here than when what we heard in like songs from the wood. I would say. And is this the is this the very last time that we hear Glasscock? This is our final our final wow. hurrah with Sweet John Glasscock. Yeah, spooky. Yeah. So let's get into music. Let's get into music. Okay. Nick, there's a sound that I want to pull out of this that I think is really delightful and fascinating and that we have talked about before, but I don't think we've talked much about in chronological order. Okay. And that is the sound of the Achordian. The Achordian? <laughs> the squeeze box. The squeeze books? <laughs> yes. No, there's an accordion sound. Now, I don't know if there it's a real is. accordion or if it's an accordion setting on the organ. I didn't hear it until this last listen that I just did. And I listened to this thing on freaking repeat today. I didn't hear it. It's very, it's barely there. But when you do catch it, it's, it's pleasant. There are some nice instances of it. It comes in right at the top. It's one of the first okay. sounds that we hear. Oh my God. It's underneath that. The flute part. Yeah. And one of the things that I really like about this about this song musically is that it kind of does what the lyrics do. It parallels the lyrics in the sense that it uses a, a traditional sound. Yeah. 
a lot of Ian's flute playing has that traditional Celtic tune and style to it, even going so far as, I believe, to add in a penny whistle or some kind of a whistle. Yep. I was going to say there is definitely a whistle in there. And I think that's why I missed the accordion. Because you were listening to the whistle. The the whistle between that penny whistle sound and the tinniness of that mandolin, I I can't hear anything else. I'm just so enwrapped by those. Caught between the whistle and the deep blue flute. That's, yeah, that's where I was. On the south side of so there's that really traditional sound to it uh, and with the accordion, you know, a, a traditional instrument. And then the guitar and the bass and, oh my gosh, and the drums yeah. come out with those terrifying electric sounds, those really threatening sounds. The, when when Martin comes in, in the verses, those stings, yeah. it's the whinny of a horse. It's so perfect. Mm. It's like, oh, there's lightning in the background. It's like, I, I, yeah. it's it feels such an very, image. very dangerous. Yeah. Well, like that is the sound that made conservative parents in the 1960s and 70s think that their kids shouldn't listen to the rock and roll. Yeah. Don't play Dungeons and Dragons. Don't listen to rock and roll. Pray and clean the and bathroom. Eat your beans. And eat your beans. Yeah. Yeah. That first sound, that opening, that's like that's like a racing horse, it's right? Like a gallop. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Good, I didn't good, think good. about that. That's so true. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't stick through the whole thing. Like it'll, it, it goes through and then it falls away and then it goes through. It's really just in between the verses, but it's definitely a horse bolting. I feel that the, I think that's, I think that's so smart that you picked up on that. For me, what I was getting was that the, the flute and the whistle and the accordion and even the drums and the bass to a certain extent are the landscape. I know are setting oh, the scene. Sure, sure. And yeah, of course. And then the electric guitar itself is the Kelpie bursting out of the water yeah. showing its head and then shoo, back under the water onto the under the surface i like that yeah well there's no wrong way to interpret it but this is the right one exactly <laughs> there are 100 wrong ways to interpret <laughs> it choose wisely there is about halfway through at about 150 there is a really classic tall breakdown in there that i feel like we yes. haven't heard something like this in quite some time I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, we have the we have the bass and flute kind of starting us off. Uh-huh. And then we move to the flute and the guitar. And then we have just the guitar in this kind of wild overdrive brief solo and then Ian comes back in. But you know, you're right. It is it is a little pleasantly formulaic. It's sort of like, "All right, everyone take your turn." Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's so, it's so classic tall. It's so like substantially tall there. Yes. But to be so heavy and be so mm. rocking there, it's so, oh, it's so meaty. It's so kefiga. Question for you, Nick. Where is the prog in this song? And that's not me saying I don't think it's there. I'm curious where you think, where you feel the prog from this song is. Could it be by virtue of playing with the mythology? And playing with that like classic sound, could that qualify it as prog? I know in the Discord we've had discussions of like what really is prog. Yeah, I, I, mean, I that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, I mean, prog is right. What is it? You know, one one thing you could say is it's anything that or anything in the tradition of pushing rock and roll, rock and roll to its um to, to its edges. You know, to see yeah. what is what is the how far can you push it in any direction? And sometimes I think what that means for Tull, at least, is all the the different, the playing with, with the meter and playing with rhythm and the different keys, key signatures. No? Key signatures? The different tempi? The different times. 
Yeah, there we go. And, you know, and, and bringing in elements of jazz and really, you know, making the chords very complex. And sometimes I think it's more on the meta level of like, we're going to take the oldest thing that we can think of, which is this crazy Scottish man-eating horse legend. Yeah. And we're going to rock it the F out in 4-4 four, four time. Right, yeah, because Ian Ian went to Loch Ness one day and, and remembered the myth and, and he was just inspired or saw a Kelpie. It's also possible. Have you ever wondered why he only has three fingers on his left hand? The others stay in the flute, right? They're, t- they just... they're, they're tucked into his pocket. Oh, okay. That's why. Oh, one of the legends, that one of the legends, the thing that I keep referring to is one of the legends was that uh, one of the typical forms the legend would take would be like, oh, well, six children went down to the lake, even though they weren't supposed to. And all six of them got onto the Kelpie. And one of them had a knife and was able to cut his own fingers off oh, yeah. to be able to let go. Right, because the lore is either you, you can't let go of the rain or you can't let go of the mane if you're holding exactly, on to the mane. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so there was one left alive to tell the tale, but that child was left defigured Disfigured. D- d- disfingered. <laughs> disfingered <laughs> by his escape. Yeah. So so don't touch horses, I guess, moral of the story. <laughs> horses are dangerous and not to be trusted. Um, another another fun, like, tall Kelpie connection. If you look at the description of the, the human form of the Kelpie. Okay. One of the traditional forms is... Like oh. a, a long-haired, mumbling old man a sitting grizzled, by the yeah. side of the road mending his pants. A grizzled old aqualung, yeah. Yeah, so it's totally, it's like, I mean, it does sort of, I think all of us like to mythologize Ian. Yes. Yeah, To I a certain so. extent. Yeah. yeah. And I think that like, you know, in our teenage years especially, I was always looking for any kind of like through line of like, well, what's the real story? About? Yeah. Is he a selkie that has come to this earth <laughs> to play the flute and enchant us? Yeah, there is a, there is certainly a convenient Venn diagram of all of these things that Ian finds interest in that they kind of overlap mostly coincidentally. You know, I, I don't think there's much like forethought of like, oh, this could be this and this could be this, but it all kind of works. It all, it all jives in the same universe. Yeah. And there's some, and I think that there's some convenience or, you know, some, some intentionality behind like, I'm going to sing a song from the perspective of this, this sexy seahorse. Yeah. Or I'm going to, I'm going to put myself in the, in the leggings of the Pied Piper. Why not? Yeah. He does fill that character. I mean, that's he has said he does fill those many tights. a time. He does fill those tights very well. All the way up to the br- my tights run of over. <laughs> and I think, you know, on a deeper level, there is something that as humans we need. Like all of our mythology comes at a certain point from our our internal need to to bring meaning to things and to and to yeah. fulfill psychologically certain urges or certain feelings. Definitely, yeah. And and so having this irresistible, mysterious force out there, being able to to name it makes us feel better about, you know, when we have these irresistible urges to do things. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And if he, you know, and if a rock star can can inhabit one of the one of the stories that is that inspires irresistible urges, all the better. Yeah, I mean, that that is not outside the realm of of roles that a rock star fulfills yeah you know? personally i like to inhabit the personification of of resistible urges when i do when i do my rock show i'm always i, I always go on as the sixth donut i was gonna say like a lemon pound cake that's a, like a day old you're like i mean i would i wouldn't hate it but it wouldn't be it's like not my first choice it's like when the donut's looking at you and you're like ah even i would judge you if you went for this yeah, don't don't eat me. Don't eat me. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even like Bear Claws. So what's this song about, Omen? Is there anything? Is it just Ian in the embodiment of the Kelpie, like the mythical creature? Is, is he the character that is the Kelpie? But also he's a sexual entity that embodies that. You know, he's got big Kelpie energy. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like it's I think, one yes. of those multi-layers like i'm just a sexy man and i'm doing these things but it's also conveniently you could describe the things that the kelpie does in this same way i think that it is 
I think that there is to a certain extent those layers there, definitely. But I think that uh, it, I think it is one of our more straightforward uh, lyrical songs. Yes. He sets up a scene. It is in the tradition of a lot of these songs, you know, um, in a lot of traditional songs. Here we have the setting. We have the young girl who went to walk in. And then there's the singer of the song who approaches the object of their desire and and basically says, what's the business thing? Introduction, personal connection, manage expectation. <laughs> I don't know this, but it's perfect. So introduction, good day to you, my fine young lady. Personal connection with your lips so sweetly full. Or no, that's part of the that's part of the introduction. Yeah, that's part of the naming. Good day to you, my fine young lady. With your lips so sweet. Personal connection. May I help you comb your long <laughs> hair? Sweep it from that brow so cool. May I help you comb your long hair? Sweep it from that brow so cool. By the way, I'm a Kelpie. Upride with me. Yeah. Right. What I want is upride with the Kelpie. I'll steal your soul to the deep. And then managing expectations, if you don't ride with me, well, the devil's free, I'll ride with somebody else. Classic networking. Expectations managed. <laughs> So when he says, while the devil's free, he's referring to himself, right? Like that's a third person. If you don't ride with me while the devil's free, yes. while I'm out on land and I'm going bonkers. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think that's an allusion to the, the earlier association that the Christian missionaries made between the Kelpie and the devil because of the host. Sure, feet. sure, sure. And the, you know, eating and dragging people down to the darkness yeah. as well. I've got a uh, velvet mondegreen. That I think oh. is, is a little funny. It's been a while since we had one of those. Is it a bear? Is he shaking his hair? Is it velvet mondegreed? Where he says, I'll steal your soul to the deep? Yes. I always thought it was, I'll steal your soul for tea. For tea? For tea. Like he would eat it for tea. Like it's not oh. even a full meal. It's just like, I'm just going to, I'm going to eat your soul. I thought, I thought you were saying that he would, he would force you to come and have crumpets with you. Oh. With him. I mean, there are, there are worse fates to be had, like being dragged underwater and drowned and eaten. Yes. But what if there's no jam to go in the crumpets, Nick? What's the point? I have two Velvet Monogreens in the same chorus. Oh, nice. Great. I always heard it as come ride with the Kelpie. Oh, sure. I think I did too. Yeah. It doesn't change the meaning that much, but up it actually, you know, specifically is like get up on my back. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm it's, a horsey. Yeah. 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 It's, a, <gasps> it's a nice imperative. <gasps> this is the film negative of Hunting Girl. Oh, okay. In Hunting Girl... The hunting girl was like, you, sexy boy, become a horse for me and I will ride you. In this, wow. the sexy horse is like, come get on my back, human, and you will ride me. Wow. Either way, Ian's getting ridden. Groundbreaking right here. You heard it here first, folks. My face is melted. <laughs> that was That's really good. That's a really good reference, Owen. The other thing that I always heard was, if you don't ride with me while the devil's free, then ride with somebody else. Oh, yeah. Which never really made sense. It's like, if you don't ride with me, you can go and ride with somebody you else. You can do exactly what you wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> I respect your boundaries. But I think in that sense, there's a bit of, well, you're missing out. You know, go ride with whoever the hell you want, but you're, if you're, you're not riding yes, with me. Definitely. But the yeah. way that it's actually written is much more direct in that sense of like, yeah. this is your chance. Yeah. Are you going to take it? I'm only eating the soul of one person today. Yeah, for tea. Yeah, be you. It's, it, that's really interesting, though. I, I do really like that because it's saying, hey, you're going to miss out. But he doesn't really say what you're missing out on is being dragged to the deeps. And which is why it's just ambiguous enough to be just a super sexy song. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, I think that that's, you know, we always... There's the trope of like the innocents are always attracted to the bad, the bad boys or the bad girls. Yeah. You know, uh, a flesh eating devil horse is the, is the ultimate 
bad it's, boy. It's the baddest of boys. It's yeah. <laughs> but I think that there is that sense of, you know, there's that like with a sexy rock star, there's that sense of ambiguity and mystery and you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Come on, baby. We'll, it's like it's like Ray Lamas. It's like you want to get sure. on my bike and we'll ride. Well, I mean, it's like Ray Lamas. It's like Velvet Green. It's like a lot of these songs that Ian has has kind of collected over the years, and now he's gone from from uh, Elizabethan player to to uh, greaser rock star to mythological entity. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's not just Ian. I mean, I mean, Led Zeppelin has plenty oh my of songs gosh, that yeah. follow in the like. Come on, shall I comb your? Shall I help to comb your hair? Probably any Rolling Stones song. I don't know many of them, but I mean, I, they feel all terribly sexy. Yes. <laughs> Wild horses couldn't drag you away. <laughs> oh, oh, but they drag, could. But they could. This one, but they can. could, and they will. Yeah. Just you know, going back to the mythology. Say goodbye to all your dear kin for they hate to see you go in your young prime. To this place of mine in the still lock far below. Say goodbye to all your dear kin, for they hate to see you go. In your young bride, to this place of mine in the still lock far below. So that's following really kind of directly the mythology. I'm going to take you to the bottom of the lake. Right. Or that's what he calls his bachelor pad. You the know, bottom of the lock. The bottom of the... Hey, I took her back to the bottom of the lock and we had a, a drop of the creature. By which I mean I cried for six hours. Oh, no. I do. I really like the lyric, the second verse. I really like the whole, the whole, the entirety of the second verse. Well, I'm a man when I'm feeling the urge to step ashore yeah. so I may charm you, not alarm you. Tell you all fine things and more. Well, I'm a man when I'm feeling... Yeah. Oh, and this is the modus operandi of the Kelpie in the mythology is it would always be like a really nice looking horse that just yeah. was just was like, um, so tempting. Yeah, it's the honey trap. It's you see this gorgeous horse bridled and you're like, wow, does nobody own this horse? This yeah. is I mean, I should I mean, no, I don't want to waste this horse. Yeah, it's like, Let it's, me like get you're, on. it's like you're out in the middle of nowhere. You're down by the lock. There's a Lamborghini with the keys in. It's yep. idling. Yep. There's no license plate. And you're like, well, I need to take, I need to drive this car to the police. Yeah. JK. It drives itself. Into a lake. Off the cliff. And it wasn't a Lamborghini. And it wasn't, it was a, a Welpy. Is there, is there a lesson to be had from the Selkie? Is it, is it teaching the people who would try to take this horse? You know, is it punishing them? Is it don't touch stuff that isn't yours? Is it don't try and break a horse? Hmm. Aside from the fear the water thing, I, I, I on I think that's the most practical yeah. value of it. I think I think that the other on a on a mythological level that works, but I'm thinking more on a fairy tale level. I think where you've got like a a moral to the story, and maybe there isn't one. Maybe there isn't one. I guess the you know what I would take for it is if it's too good to be true. If it, if it seems too good to be true, oh, it sure. probably is. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a horse with a note that says, ride me. <laughs> that was my Halloween costume. That is, yeah. Yeah, your back was super sore after that, but wow. you yeah. said you did enjoy it, so. Yeah, a moral. Now, you know, the thing that I love about a lot of the old myths is that they are amoral. Not not immoral, but they are amoral. They have, they, there's no moral. That's true. Some of them, yeah. You're talking really, really old. Well, what's the moral of a werewolf? Well, that's not a uh, that's not a myth. Don't wear a wolf. Don't wear a wolf. I, I hope it's a myth. What are you saying, Nick? <laughs> that's just a supernatural creature, though. That's not like oh, the myth of the werewolf. It's not like there's a set story. I think the myth of lycanthropy goes back pretty far. But but it's there's not a set story that has a beginning, middle, and end. It's just that oh, this is a supernatural creature. Mm. But also, yes, there is there is a a, a moral to werewolves and it, it was it was putting on the the animalistic nature of dangerous men. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So yeah. dr- drinking at night and be- becoming dangerous. Right. Yeah. Sometimes people get so overcome with their animalistic side that they can't control themselves. And so you should. Yeah. Yeah. You should shoot them. With a silver bullet. Silver which, bullet. oddly enough, is a way to kill a Kelpie, actually. It really makes me, makes you wonder if uh, if big silver bullet might be behind all these myths. That's it. Big silver is really just, we're all in the pockets of big silver. What are we doing next week? You don't know this one. I rarely know <laughs> what we're doing next week. What are we doing? You, I don't think you know this song. Go on. Urban Apocalypse. I, I did live in New York. But um, I don't know that song and I'm super excited. That's great. It's got a long and storied past. But it's not that long and not that storied. <laughs> but it's got a... It's got a future beyond this version of the song. We'll get get two stories. We'll get into it. It's it's got a shed in the back. (laughs) It's got an in-law apartment above the garage. Yeah. Until next week, we would love to drag you to a deep, watery, dark place called our Discord, which you can get access to for a mere $5 a month. That's five American dollars. That's barely any pounds. If you don't give us five stars... Well, the podcast's free, then we'll ask someone else for five stars because it's totally up to you, but we do appreciate it. We have stepped ashore to charm you into giving us five stars. Yeah, we're a podcast when we feel the urge to step ashore. (laughs) (laughs) Until next week, I am no longer in my young prime in this place of mine, Nick McGill. I am... So sweetly full, Omen said. We will follow you with a will as the feckless moans. And this is the podcast that sweeps your hair from that brow so cool. Talk tall to me. Whoa. Hey. Hey, boy. Where's your rider? That that bridle is very nice. You could be my rider. You you speak? I do more than speak, little girl. Wow. Oh, your hair is all over the place. So is yours. Your mane is luscious. Oh, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. Oh, oh, look at how shiny my coat is. Doesn't it just beg to be petted? May I? May I pet you? Pet away. <laughs> oh, it is so soft. <laughs> so silky. <laughs> I am very impressed. I do a lot of seaweed wraps. Oh, <clears throat> I, yeah. You do feel a little damp still. Did you just, you must have just come from one. Uh, it's all the, uh, it's all the, uh, the, uh, um, the sweat from prancing in the hillside. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you came in very quickly. Very, look, very quickly. Look how shiny oh. and supple my saddle is. Oh, very. <laughs> that is, the whoever owns you must really take care of their tack. Oh, maybe no one owns me. <laughs> you oh. could own me Can for a day. For a day? <laughs> could, I mean, I have nothing to do. I finished my chores. I, do you, could I just... Hop on your saddle just for a Ooh. little bit? What's the risk? Who would know? If we, I'm just a wee lost little pony. If you take me back to my house, I could give you a carrot. Back to you. Oh, I have somewhere much more interesting to go. Clip, clap, clip, clap. clip oh, all right, here we clap, go. Here we go. Clip, clap. Oh, oh, wow, you're really oof. high up. You're, heav- you're heav- heavier than you look. I, I eat a lot of oats. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, before we go, you gotta do... Oh, it's just... Take okay. your time. Take your time. Okay. It's it's oh, nice it's up here. Bit long, bit long time. This this is why I don't come to Dunkirk and fly anymore. <laughs> okay, okay. Before we go off, <laughs> clip, clap. Before we, before we go off, you got to three rules. Okay. Uh, you got hold on tightly to my mane. Okay. Uh, Roger. Uh, don't, got it. Don't kick me so hard because uh, I'm sensitive around the midriff. Okay. 
And the most important thing to remember is no matter what happens, no matter how fast we go, uh -huh. no matter where we're going, always okay. remember yes. that Talk Tall to Me is a proud member of the Feckless Moans Audio Network. No! <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>